Hi everybody, I'm Dr. John Duyard, and today I want to talk about the Ayurvedic take on the book, The Five Love Languages by Gary Chapman. You know, love is a really important topic from the Ayurvedic perspective because from that perspective, love is in fact our true nature. The science shows that when we actually love and give and care for others, some major things happen to us. Our telomeres, which are a measure of longevity, the longer they are, the longer you live. The more stressed out you are, the shorter you live. We find that when you give and you care and love others, your telomeres lengthen. There's a hormone called oxytocin, which is the loving and giving hormone called the longevity hormone. And when you love and give and care, you actually live longer. When you actually give to people and give gifts, uh, studies show that it actually changes your genetic code. Uh, your good bugs thrive uh, when you give and love and care for others and your bad bugs disappear when you give and love and care for others. Well, I was so fascinated by this book called The Five Love Languages because it was so closely related to some of the very major Ayurvedic principles. You know, the, the definition of Ayurveda, Ayur mean life, Veda means truth, means all, a whole science about living the truth of your life. You know, one of the major branches of Ayurveda was Rasayana, the study of longevity, how we can actually, uh, you know, live, our, live life in a balanced way so we can live long and have the time, the years that we need to fully become conscious. And most of us live in an unconscious way. Um, one study, a handful of studies actually show that 95% of the things that we think and say and do as adults come from impressions we experienced in the first six years of life, suggesting that most of us walk around pretty unconscious. You know, most of what we say and think is based on some old impression, uh, patterns of behavior that we needed and worked well when we were young. But as we get older and we continue to project those old protective patterns on the screen, um, they don't seem to serve us as well as they once did. But they're sort of locked in as repetitive behavioral patterns. We do the same dumb thing again and again and again. This is a big part of Ayurvedic of psychology, is to free yourself from the need to be loved. And in this book, The Five Love Languages, it's really all about freeing yourself to need to be loved by actually experiencing how amazing it is to actually give to others, you know. Uh, there's a handful of studies about when you actually give people things like how much healthier you become and much, how much happier you become when you actually do that. They gave people money and they were, had a choice to spend it on themselves in one study or spend it on others. And when they spent it on others, they were so much more happy. They even did that in third world countries where they didn't have any money hardly at all. And when they still spent whatever, that little bit of money that they had on others, they still felt so much better and happier than when they would spend it on themselves, even when they had nothing. So the science is in on the giving and the loving and the joy. So when I read this book, The, the Five Love Languages, I was sort of interested to do like an Ayurvedic take on it and talk about how the different body types, for example, would, would uh, handle each of the five love languages. And the five love languages are very simple. They're words of affirmation, uh, giving gifts, touching, um, acts of service, and spending quality time. And those are the things that are really obvious and really logical, but in the Ayurvedic perspective, each body type may have, mm, you know, the ability to do one of those better than the other. So I want to talk about that, and I also want to talk about um, sort of how we can make sure that these love languages are... Um, you know, tapping into the deepest possible transformational change, freeing ourselves from that need to be loved and approved of in the deepest possible way. And that's something that uh, is a really big part of the Ayurvedic perspective. So let's talk about uh, words of affirmation, the first love language. Oh, before I do that, um, you know, when, you, when we do these love language, we give and care and touch and spend quality time with folks and acts of service and all that, it, it has to be from a place of not getting anything in return. In the Bhagavad Gita, one of the major Ayurvedic texts or, or, or yogic texts, you could say, uh, they talk about establishing being and then performing action. Acting 
from the level of your truth. That's why the word ayur is life, vedas, truth. Is, we're all about acting on the truth of your life, which is to be loving and giving and caring, which is what these love languages are all about. But if you do it with an expectation to get something in return, it defeats the purpose, as you'll see in some of the studies that I'm going to talk about here in a minute. So one of the ways to kind of drop in and make sure that you're doing it from the deepest part of your truth is to count the ways you love the person that you're going to use your love languages on. And one of my favorite ways to do that is you're actually writing a love letter. A love letter that they never get to read. I mean, they could, but initially it's for you. And you write a list of all the things that you love about that person. Um, and sometimes it takes a while to get through some of the things that you're irritated about. But when you finally get to the things you write about, the things that you love and you appreciate and you, and, and you really <clears throat> uh, admire about that person, you ask yourself, how does it make you feel when you write about that stuff that's really connected to the truth of the relationship? And if it makes you feel expanded, then those are the things that we're going to use to put into action. So when we talk about words of action, words of uh, affirmation, rather, the words of affirmation mean writing, you know, uh, using words, talking, writing notes, somehow using your words to affirm that you love that person. It's always good to, to affirm that based on something that's truthful. So when you write this love letter, you have this this list of things that when you thought about them that made you feel so expanded, made you feel so good, that these are real. So now if I write about them, uh, you can really uh, have a real deep heart-to-heart -heart connection and you'll see why that's important in just a minute. Um, so let's say you just send you know, a text and just tell your loved one, partner, spouse, wife, husband, whatever, um, that you know, just send a random text saying, I love you. Um, it could be a little bit deeper than that. It could be something like, gosh, I'm so grateful to having you in my life. It could even be deeper than that and say, God, I've never met anybody as giving and caring as you. The key to these kind of little texts or little notes in their sock drawer or little notes in their lunch bag or a little quick text or whatever it is, this random act of kindness, the, the key to this is that you make sure that whatever you write doesn't have doesn't um, require them to do anything except just sit there and bathe in your love in your sunlight you know and get a, like a sunlight tan you know they're just getting wow that felt so good i just feel like i just got a dose of love and it felt so warm warm enough to make them feel safe enough to feel willing to open up the delicate petals of their flower to let something more real out. So this is the way you do it, is you make sure that you don't put any hooks in it for them to have to go, hey, I love you, honey, but can you stop by the store and pick up some groceries or whatever? No, that's not the time for that. This is just the giving part. No getting at all. Got it? Good. Because one of the golden rules is you give without expectation, right? So, so anyway, Vata types are really good at words. I mean, they talk, 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 talk. They're really good at it. And, and, um, and so it's really easy then to write notes and do that. And they should totally capitalize on their constitutional proclivities, that they have this ability to do this in a really cool way. And they should definitely do it. Pitta types are, are, um, you know, are also talkers, but they generally don't always connect with their heart. They're very goal-oriented and they love the reward. They love to make things and make things happen. And uh, so they have to be trained to just settle it down and give from a a perspective of, of them. And that's why that love letter is so important. They really connect like, wow, I really do appreciate that part of, of my partner. And I really want to express that appreciation and connect those dots as opposed to saying, um, you know, uh, yeah, honey, I love you. Let's go on a hike. You know, that requires them to do something, right? So it's just, it's, it's not engaging in an activity with the pitta types. Now the kapha types, you know, they are really good at this because they are um, they're, they're naturally deep and calm and easygoing. They just need a push and a reminder to actually do it because they always are feeling it. They just don't always engage in it. They're not like they're not big talkers and you know life of the party. They're really quiet and sublime, and, but they function on a, on a more subtle level. So, so allowing them to connect at that time. In the same way, quality time, which is the next language of love, is spending time, quality time, with them. Now the Vata times, Vata people, they tend to have 
a lot on their plate. Their vata, their mind is going 90 miles an hour. And it's hard for them to get a routine, hard for them to have, you know, eat meals at the same time every day. It's hard for them to do anything at the same time every day. So sometimes finding quality time is hard for their schedule because they're just not good at scheduling things. The pitta body type, they are over scheduled usually. And when they do want to schedule it, once again, they like to accomplish things. So like, hey, let's go play some tennis and have quality time. That may be what your, you and your partner love to do, but it also what we're talking about here is quality time doing things that make sure you both really love them. You both love them. Now it's like, I love tennis and I'm teaching you how to play tennis or I love to go cycling, but you can't really talk during that period of time or really talk during tennis players matches, but it's sort of fun and you're together and it's great. But this is really about quality time so you can have that time to have, uh, you know, a heart-to-heart -heart talk or connect on some deeper level. And that's really important. Now the kapha types, they're really good at this because that's just their thing. They're calm, they're easygoing, they're naturally really good talkers, um, and they're naturally deep connectors. So quality time with them. They tend to love sitting around the fire and having deep conversations. Pitta types, they love changing the world, building buildings and making things happen. Vata types, they're the creative ones. They're the ones, you know, if you were all cavemen and cave women. You'd find the vata types drawing on the walls and writing things down and looking at the stars, super creative, highly sensitive, very aware. The Pitta cave people would be, you know, building a deck over the cave overlooking the valley because they just want a bigger cave or making an extra room or whatever. And the kapha types are like, God, will you guys stop with all the banging and sit down by the fire and let's tell stories, right? Because that's the kapha type. So they're really good at quality time. They're really good at communicating, but they're kapha and they need a little bit of a nut, which is kind of a, a cool, a cool thing, uh, which is really important. Now, the other piece of the puzzle is giving gifts. You know, vata types are a little on the frugal side, um, but they have to be reminded to give gifts sometimes. Uh, but they're also very sensitive, and they, so they do appreciate the idea of giving. Pitta types love to give, but they like to get a reward. They want the praise. They want the plaque on the wall. And they have to always be reminded to stop going for the glory and the reward and start to connect at a deep level. If those pitta types would take all that energy and that fire and drive it inward and experience pull back that inner bow and become still inside and then act from that deep level of silence, wow. There's no more powerful spiritual atonement than that. That's crazy. Um, but they have to go change the world first. So this is why we have a long life and, and we go from our kapha time of life when you're young kids to the pitta time of life when you're changing the world and then the vata time of life when it's governed by air and spirit and that's when we become more aware that there's a little bit more to life than a bigger house and a bigger car and a huge successful career or whatever that might be for a pit of body type, right? So that's important to, to realize. Now the kapha types, they're also really big gift giver, gifts givers. And for them, it is very easy for them to give without any expectation. So the key here is to learn to give without expectation. And there was a study done where they gave gifts one way with an expectation called hedonistic giving, another way without uh, an expectation where they just gave and they loved the giving of the gift that was enough for them and that was called eudaimonic giving giving for the cause I just love the giving and that's all I need I don't need a return on the investment right the hudan hedonistic giving they always wanted that little bit of a reward when they gave they gave the gift in a hedonistic way it had a negative effect on the genetic code when they gave in a eudaimonic way no return on investment no need for anything in return it had a positive change of their genetic code, suggesting that when you are giving with a little bit of a hook to get something in return, they can tell. They can tell and they're not going to feel safe because you've got a hook involved here to open up their heart, their delicate petals, you could say, and give fully back. So when I give fully to someone, eudaimonically, they're going to feel a positive change in their genetic code. That's science. And when they feel that, they're going to feel safe enough to open up at a subtle level and give back. And that is a heart-to-heart -heart connection. That's a love language bar none. When you really give in a way that Ayurveda talks about connects on a conscious level versus an unconscious level. Conscious means you're conscious of your truth, the Ayurveda of you, the truth of you. 
Unconscious means you're still engaged in old protective batter patterns of behavior when you were a young kid. Did you needed mom and dad's love and approval? Because if you didn't have their love and approval when you were a young kid, you would have walked out into the jungle, got eaten by a lion, and there'd be no people here. So we are, as human beings, hardwired to need the approval of others, particularly our parents, because so they watch over us and keep us healthy and safe. But as we grow up, we need to become conscious and realize that I don't need that approval and appreciation to feel good anymore. I actually will feel much better when I give and love and, and care, which is why this love love language thing is so cool because it's giving people a map to, to, and permission to love in these ways that if you do it right, connects on such a deep eudaimonic level with no expectation to get anything in return where the person you're loving feels safe to open up their heart so fully and you have your heart so fully because you want nothing in return and that's a communion of something we call true love or truth which is what Veda is about connecting at that really deep level where you're safe enough to really give yourself and let who you are out not caring what they think out there because most of us spend our lives engaging in behavior, trying to get the outside world to like us, approve of us, appreciate us. And that gives us some temporary reward chemistry levels of satisfaction, but never long lasting, right? And then there's touch. Touch is the, 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 the universal expression of love, touching and hugging and caring and petting. And we know when young uh, babies are touched, they, they live longer, they thrive health, health wise. And when they're not touched by their mother, they don't studies have been done and done and done and done again we know that what how the mechanism of that is through something called oxytocin oxytocin is the longevity hormone and it's connected with bonding and loving and caring and when you love and touch your partner you create oxytocin when you love and touch your baby and massage them you create oxytocin ayurvedically people are said are told to to give yourself a daily Ayurvedic massage, give your kids Ayurvedic massage daily to keep that bond alive with your, with your children, but also with your own self. That self-love connection creates oxytocin inside of your own self or touching others. It's an oxytocin bond at a very, very deep level. Unlike dopamine, where the more you stimulate and buy stuff and get rewards, the bigger the stimulant needs to be to get that same reward Oxytocin is the complete opposite. The more you give in love and care and touch and others and hug others or whatever, the more oxytocin you make. You can't make enough of it. I mean, there's, there's no limit to how much you can make, which is super cool. So that's uh, the, the touching. And touching is really, really easy for the kapha types because they're sort of touchy and feely. Pitta types, they oftentimes touch with the reward, right? They want something in return. And there's, there's actually uh, groups, they're called cuddle groups, where people would who are always about getting the reward, you know, touching with benefits kind of a thing. Um, they have found that when, that when people actually just cuddle, and they have these groups where strangers come in and they just touch and, and hold each other, but no sexual inclination whatsoever, just touching. And it's that touch that makes people feel safe and, and, and the love starts to come out at that deep level of touch at a subtler level. And if you practice that, if you're a pitta type and always want to touch and and uh, with rewards and things, you may want to just try having no sex and just touching and bonding and just allowing that to be the experience that you have. And you'll be blown away by the depth of love and appreciation that you have for each other. It's a really powerful thing, powerful tool, powerful exercise, really something ex to experience. Um, the Vata types, you know, they love to be touched. The Pitta types, the Kapha types, uh, they love to touch. And the Pitta types, of course, uh, love to touch with rewards. So you have to be careful about that. And then the last one is acts of service. Doing things for other people. Thinking about what you can do to help someone in a service-oriented way. And all the science that I mentioned is absolutely, you know, uh, supported by acts of service. You know, how the body lives longer and is healthier when you give and care for others in a big way. Um, in that, in that, uh, that, statement from the from the Bhagavad Gita, Yoga Sta Kuru Kamani, which means first perform, um, establish being, become still, pull back the bow, hold that bow perfectly still, right? If you're not silent in your own self, you can't understand the truth from the non-truth. The lake is turbulent, you can't see the bottom. But if you pull back the bow and hold it very still, and the mind is very still, 
you can see deep into the lake. You can see the bottom. You can see the truth. You can become more self-aware. And then when, instead of releasing the bow from a moving string where you'll never find the arrow in your life, but when you pull back that bow and hold it and then take action from that, that is a transformational arrow. And there's a Vedic science called Dhanurved, the, the, the Veda of the bow, which is the Veda of transformation. And that acts of service, taking action, is the key. You know, we have, uh, you, know, you know, no shortage of meditation programs out there, yoga, meditation, breathing, all that. But all that is designed to give you self-awareness. And once you have that self-awareness, then you must take action to free yourself from the old patterns and change your brain chemistry, something called neuroplasticity. And all the research on yoga, breathing, meditation, all this stuff has been shown to change the neuroplasticity of the brain, to make it actually more malleable. So we can actually change old patterns and become conscious again. That's the whole point of this, is to become conscious and do this at a really deep level. So I always recommend things that I call random acts of kindness, looking for ways to help them. Not because you're like always right off the bat, the person that just wants to help others. But you look for it because you're training your brain, laying down new neural pavement in your brain through neuroplasticity to engage in this behavior of loving and giving and caring or connecting. It could be the person you know, checking you out at Walmart. It could be your waiter or waitress at a restaurant. It could be you know, looking for, you know, when you come home from you know, a, 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 you know, yoga class and your husband or partner is watching the game on TV and they're doing their thing and you're just doing your thing. Now we're going to continue to do separate things. Why not, you know, an act of service would be to sit down and watch the game with them and, and be there, even though if you're not into basketball or whatever it might be. But that's the, the name of, that's what love is, is giving yourself and then realizing that through that love, there's a connection that can be made that's way bigger than who won the game, right? And, but we oftentimes just say, oh, well, they're watching the game. I better just go read another book or go whatever and do my thing. And they do their thing. And then there's always a little resentment that lingers from that kind of stuff, you know? And they feel it. You know, if you walk into the house and the husband's watching the game and you see him and you're not really happy with the fact that he's watching the game, maybe drinking a beer or whatever, then they're going to feel that little bit of constriction. And uh, so when you come out and come back together, he's already feeling a little bit contracted, right? So you're going to feel that at a subtle level. So when you try to, you know, open up to him, he's a little bit contracted. He may not respond as quickly. So we start functioning on this dysfunctional platform of not feeling safe enough to be vulnerable enough to give ourselves fully to the other person. And that's, it all starts with these little subtle things that happen in a daily life that people feel just a little bit hurt, but no big deal, but they build up. And random acts of kindness lay down the neural pavement. So what happens then is you have this road to go, God, that felt great to glove and give them a massage or a back rub or, or make some tea or go do something for this or that person. All the doors of, of giving and, and, and feeling really good from the inside out start to open up. And then what happens is I call it the, this, this uh, you know, then there's the heat of battle where you bump up against a situation where someone triggers you and you're instantly reacting to their behavior, doing them. And, but as you lay down more, you know, random acts of kindness and more neural pavement on the giving side of things, you'll start to realize that you don't have to react to that situation. You can let that go by and there's another way to act from them. Instead of doing them, reacting to their stress, you could reflect on yourself, realizing that's, that's their stress. And through the window of love and compassion, you can take an action step and free yourself from actually having to react to them. And I call that responding to feelings of affliction, being hurt by someone else, um, with affection. And that only happens after you started laying down some of this neural pavement, these random acts of kindness begin to open up the door where you start to feel safe enough to not be so hyper reactive to someone who is, is you know, perceived by you as a threat or they're not acting in the way that makes you feel comfortable so then you just push away. There's always an opportunity for you to look deeper within and look for ways for you to do you. It's called subjective referral versus redoing them, 
which is called object referral. You're referring your behavior based on something outside of you. And the whole goal, like I said, is to free yourself from needing to be loved and approved and appreciated and feeling free to do you. Free to be subjectively engaging in behavior based on you versus in, in any way. It's very difficult to say in any way, but, um, but to be uh, independent of the field is what they say in psychology, which means that your, 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 your behavior is not dependent on the outside world. You're doing you and there's no expectation to get anything returned, so you're free. There you have it, the Ayurvedic approach on the five love languages. Thanks for listening. I'm Dr. John Deyart. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by Life Spa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at lifespa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.